right, so ecosystem balance. This is going to be our new unit, and I'm going to have this presentation done for y'all beforehand so y'all can go back and watch it at your own pace. In this section, we're going to be building on what we've talked about so far, and we're going to be expanding it to bring in relationships, ecological succession, and stability. So a quick recap. Um, what we've covered so far, we've talked about food webs, food pyramids, trophic levels. We've talked about um, biodiversity, which is variety of life. We've talked about how um, each organism has its own job, its own niche, and that the more variety we have, the more niches we have, the more healthy an environment. So now we're going to talk about another way that we're going to reach balance in our ecosystem. So we have to have balance in our food webs, balance with our niches, balance with abiotic and biotic factors. And remember, abiotic factors means non-living, so that would be temperature and sunlight. Whereas biotic factors are going to be living things, so plants and animals. So first off, remember, relationships and ecosystems are pretty complex. Um, we've done simplified versions, simplified versions, but as you can see in the diagram right here about cod, it can be a pretty complex system. The more that we look at these systems and their complexity um, and their, all their connections, the more we can understand what's actually happening. So we can see how important one species is to another. So as a recap, remember, all predators and preys exist. Um, predators are organisms that actively hunt others. Prey are ones that get hunted. Predators and prey are very closely linked. If I have a large prey population, I have a large predator population. So what that means is if I have 100 bunnies, I should have enough predators of bunnies to keep that population in check. If I only had 50 bunnies, I will have fewer predators because I have fewer food options for them. So right here are some predators. These are organisms that actively hunt. In the top left corner, we have a lynx. They are similar to bobcats. They are um, larger cats found in Canada, the northern um, United States. We have a polar bear here with a seal kill, then we have a praying mantis with a butterfly, and then we have an, a hawk with a fish. So all of them represent a predator-prey relationship. Now getting on with this predator-prey relationship, right here we have um, the snowshoe hare with the Canadian lynx, that cat that I showed you earlier. So this chart, this graph is going to show us how many animals in the number of thousands on our y-axis existed from the years 1845 to 1925. And we're going to look at a comparison between the snowshoe hare in the green line and the Canadian lynx in the orange line. So if we look here at this diagram, we can see that when the lynx population goes down, we see a delayed reaction, but the Canadian lynx goes down. When the snowshoe hare population goes up, we have a little bit of a delay, and then the Canadian lynx population goes up. And we see this repeated multiple times throughout this graph. So what does that tell us? Well, this tells us that they have a very important relationship. As the population of the hare goes up, so does the population of the lynx. Now, the reason why there's a delay is Predators need time to reproduce. They don't necessarily reproduce in the same season. So they're going to have a delay increase. And when they finally get increased, you notice like right here where there's an overlap of them having almost the same number, that's when we start seeing the number of prey get too low to support the number of predators. So we see the predators dying off or moving out. Now, in this unit, we're going to talk about a few important relationships called symbiotic relationships. The first one we're going to look at is parasitism. So parasitism is going to be a, relation, a symbiotic relationship in which one organism feeds on the tissues or body fluids of another. They are broken down into two categories of either being the host organism, so this is the one that's being fed off of, or the parasite themselves, the one that benefits. So the parasite, the one that benefits in this relationship, is harmful to their hosts in a lot of different ways. And most of the time, their objective is not to kill the host, but they do have the potential of killing their host. 
Some examples would be ticks, fleas, tapeworms, ringworms, um, anything that comes and gets nutrients off of other organisms and leaves them in a negative spot. So right here we see some images of that. So um, up top you see like hookworms, ringworms, you see ticks in the top right corner, you see in the bottom left corner right here, this is an image of tapeworms from someone's digestive tract. I know you. And then right here, this is the idea of a parasitism in this situation where they are stealing resources from this business. Now, with parasitism, okay, a true parasite is going to want to live in or on the bodies of its host, and it has to have the host to survive. No host, the parasite dies. So the population of the parasite is very heavily influenced by the number of hosts. So if I have a large number of hosts, I should expect to see a large number of parasites. This means that parasites are a density dependent limiting factor for host animals. So think about dogs, all right? If you've ever heard of the parvovirus um, or you've ever had dogs get worms, you know for a fact that once one dog gets worms, you gotta treat the whole pack, the whole litter, or the worms are going to be running rampant. And once you've treated them, you gotta go and treat the yard. It's not just a simple, let me give them a pill or a topical treatment and we're done. No, you gotta make sure you do multiple treatments. The more dogs you have, the more dogs you'll have that'll have worms. If you only have one dog that has worms, it's pretty easy to treat that infection. But if you have five or six dogs, you may end up having to try to treat the same worm infestation for a while until you get it all gone. So right here, this is an example of another parasite, an organism that lives off of another and may potentially cause harm to the host. So as I said, parasitism was the first type of symbiotic relationship we were going to talk about. And that should be one that you've heard about growing up. So symbiosis is a relationship in which two species live closest together. So we have parasitism, which we've talked about. There's commensalism, where one species benefits and the other one is not affected, and mutualism where both species benefit. So commensalism is going to be the next one we talk about. This one is where one benefits and the other is not harmed. So in the picture here we have a whale and the barnacles. The barnacles do nothing to the whale. The whale is not impacted by them at all. The barnacles though get a positive environment to live in. They get the movement of the whale. This means that they get opportunities to get more food than if they were on, say, a pole or a cliff. So in this situation, the barnacle benefits because it gets more food and the whale just gets to live its life. So nothing is, the whale is not harmed nor helped. With mutualism, all right, for example, we have the bees and the flowers. This is a mutual relationship where both benefit because the bees need something to eat. So they go collect the pollen and the nectar and the flowers need help with reproduction. So when the bees are collecting the nectar from the flower, they get covered in pollen. And they will go to the, a flower of the same species and disperse that pollen. So when they land in another flower, they lose the pollen they carried and may gather different pollen. This allows for the flowers to reproduce. So this is mutualism because the bee gets food and the flowers get help having seeds. Now, the next thing in this unit that we're going to talk about with balance is going to be ecological succession. So what is succession? Well, succession is how ecosystems and environments evolve and change over time. So organisms affect the environments in which they live, and the environment affects the organisms. When a species niche disappears, a new niche usually appears. Not necessarily the same niche, but may be similar or may be completely different. Change is constantly happening, so animals have to be able to adapt. So if we look right here, we see the evolution of the bending unit, um, bender, unit 22. And you can see where they, they started off with a little um, CD and then turned into a cube and then baby robots growing all the way up. So the first type of succession we have in any environment is going to be what we call primary succession. This is going to be the first stage. This is going to be where there's originally no life. So not even bacteria. And this is going to be the foundation of a new habitat. So an environment like 
this would be an area that has just cooled from a volcanic eruption. This may be rocks that are exposed um, from being deep underground because of an earthquake. So these are going to be areas that have never supported life. No life exists. So how do we get there? Having life. Well, in primary succession, we're going to start off with lichen. This is a fungus and an algae that live in a mutualistic relationship. So they both benefit. Okay. The lichen gets its energy source from the algae. The fungus gets its energy source from the algae. The algae gets a place to live on top of the fungus. So the lichen is this fungus algae relationship. The lichen breaks down the rock and turns it into soil. When this happens, we now have um, the ability for other organisms to move in. Because lichen are the first ones to come in, we call them a pioneer species. Because just like the pioneers moving westward, these would be the first ones to come into an area. Now, once those lichens have created that soil, we're going to have wind bringing in seeds and animals that fly overhead sometimes will um, poop and when they poop they bring in seeds and those seeds will take root in the new soil. Now this soil is just mainly minerals. It doesn't have a lot of other nutrients. So over time the soil is going to have the seeds sprout, they're going to die and decay, and we're going to end up with more fertile soil coming through. As this happens the grass, uh, the soil is going to get deeper and more fertile and we're going to see plants such as grass move in and change into shrubs, plants, trees, until we have reached um, an apex community or a climax community. So a climax community is one that does not undergo any further succession. So that would be a deciduous forest. So a forest like what we lived in um, prior to humans coming and cutting down the trees in this area, that would have been a climax community. It would not be able to get any better. Usually climax communities are very diverse and they can survive a lot of disturbance. So a forest fire might come through, but animals are still going to be able to survive. So here's a diagram, an image of what it would look like. So we start off with the exposed rocks. We have lichens move in, mosses move in, we develop soil. Then we start having small grasses, then we start getting some shrubs. That's where the heath mat is. And then we start getting the pine trees, the conifers, such as the jack pine, black spruce, aspen. And then that forest is going to evolve into a deciduous forest if it's in the right area. And we're going to have things like the balsam fir, the paper birch, and the white spruce. And that's going to be a climax community. It's going to have extreme biodiversity. It's going to have extremely rich soil. It's going to be a beautiful environment. Now, secondary succession. Come on, if we have primary succession, we have secondary succession. Secondary succession happens where something disturbs organisms, but does not destroy the soil. So things like this would be fire, severe storms, and human activity. So once again, something comes through and destroys the ecosystem, but not the soil. We have aquatic succession, and this happens when a lake is newly formed. Um, one way that a lake can be formed is a retreating glacier. So when a glacier goes away, that's a big chunk of ice, it leaves a gouge in the ground and that fills up with water. Over time, sediments and seeds are going to be put into that water and we're going to start seeing aquatic plants to grow. Um, we're going to see other organic matter get shoved into the lake and it's going to start decaying, which means it gets more nutrients, which means more animals can come in. As time continues, and we have more weathering and erosion, so more sediments being washed into the lake. It's going to continue to fill until there's not much of a lake left and we have a marsh. And then that's going to dry out and turn into a meadow and then into a forest. So right here for the Great Lakes, for example, we have 14,000 years ago, we had the glaciers expanding. So they come in, they start gouging into the ground. Then 9,000 years ago, they're starting to kind of retreat. They're starting to go back and those gouges are starting to come out and we're starting to fill in the, with water. 7,000 years ago, we see a slight change in where it's located and the size of it. And then 4,000 years ago, we've lost the glacier altogether and we have the beautiful Great Lakes left behind and they are filled with water and sediments. So here's a side view of what happens with aquatic succession. Notice we have a beautiful pond, a beautiful lake, and over time it gets more shallow as more sediment fills in. 
And as that happens, it turns from a pond into a marsh, then to a meadow, and then to a forest. The next type of succession is going to be island succession. And this is talking about how new islands that form from volcanic eruptions can have living things on them. So islands are a unique situation. They are surrounded by water on all sides. That means that for life to get there, something has to tote it. This can be done by wind, water, or another organism. So many islands, because of how, of how they're isolated, have a large diversity of birds. They have a lot of different types of birds. And since birds are usually some of the first animals to get there, they usually have a lot of niches there to fill. Think about Australia. Australia has some very unique animals. So stability of the ecosystem talks about how easy an ecosystem can recover if something happens to it. We tend to think about more connections, more stable. If I can go out and have five different grocery stores to shop from in my community, if one grocery store is out of milk, I still have four other places to go get milk. I have a very stable food supply. Same thing kind of applies to the ecosystem. The more stable my food supply, the more connections I have, the less impact I will have if I remove something. So that one store being out of milk doesn't hurt me as much as if all the stores were out of milk. Now, there can be major disturbances in the ecosystem, such as the meteor strike that we saw with the dinosaurs in which everything got destroyed and we rebuilt everything from the ground up. In that situation, no matter how stable the ecosystem was, it was very difficult for it to recover. If we have minor disturbances like fires, human activity, most environments can recover pretty quickly. So a general rule we keep is uh, keep in mind is that species and whole ecosystems will evolve and die out, but new species and ecosystems will evolve and replace them. So with the stability, ecosystems impact organisms, organisms impact ecosystems. So one part of an ecosystem should theoretically impact another part of the ecosystem. We do not know how a change of the ecosystem, let's say cutting off um, the limbs of a tree, how that will impact the runoff creek we have. So there's a chaos theory that exists and it says that ecosystems are extremely sensitive to the smallest changes and the initial state of an ecosystem is crucial to its later development. Think kind of like the butterfly effect. The smallest little thing can have the massive impact but we won't know it until its time has passed. Currently, um, organisms are dying out really fast, and this is because of human interaction. So our population growth, we're taking over habitats, we're introducing foreign species, and we're causing a lot of pollution. This means that the stability is in question for these ecosystems. We're taking away the biodiversity.